From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, the man who I have put in charge of streamlining the government, building the wall with Mexico and brokering Middle East peace. The only thing I won't let him do is marry my daughter, the Jared Kushner of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, David Feldman. Hello, David. It's funny you compare me to Jared Kushner because I can't tell you the number of people who walk up to me after listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour and say, what are you doing there? (laughs) We'll find some use for you, David. Don't worry. The man we definitely need is the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, and this is a very serious and stunning program we have today. You are correct, Ralph. On the show today, we are going to be talking about the famine crisis in the Middle East and Africa with Scott Paul, who is Senior Humanitarian Policy Advisor for Oxfam America. We're also going to talk about superbugs, antibiotic-resistant bacteria that threaten human health and what we need to do about it. So very, very important, serious show today. Joining us for the superbug discussion will be Emily L. Heil, who is professor of pharmacy practice and science at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy in Baltimore. We will also, as usual, check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber, the Pete, Julie, and Link of the corporate crime beat. For all you uh, people out there old enough to remember the Mod Squad. If we have time, we will also get to some listener questions. But first, no subject is too big for us and not too many subjects are bigger and more important than world hunger. David? Scott Paul works for Oxfam, which is an organization that works on issues of inequality, discrimination, and unequal access to resources, including food, water, and land. Mr. Paul is Oxfam America's senior humanitarian policy advisor, focusing on East Africa, and has been a contributing writer to the policy blog, The Washington Note, and a frequent speaker on U.S.-U.N. relations, human rights, climate change, and U.S. public engagement on global issues. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Scott Paul. Thanks very much. It's great to be on. Indeed. Welcome, Scott Paul. As we delve into this subject and uh, the worsening aspect of it in this country with the Trump regime withdrawing international aid and forsaking the U.S.'s historic role in responding to famines. I want to read a little excerpt from the New York Times, an article by Jeffrey Gettleman titled, Drought and War, Heightened Threat of Not Just One Famine, But Four. And he filed the report from Baidoa in Somalia. And here are his words, quote, first the trees dried up and cracked apart. Then the goats keeled over. Then the water in the village well began to disappear turning cloudy, then red, then slime green. But the villagers kept drinking it. That was all they had. Now on a hot, flat, stony plateau outside Baidoa, thousands of people pack into destitute camps, many clutching their stomachs, some defecating in the open, others already dead from a cholera epidemic. Quote, even if you can get food, there's no water, end quote, said one mother, Sangabo Molin, who held her head with a left hand as thin as a leaf and spoke of her body burning. Another famine is about to tighten its grip on Somalia. And it's not the only crisis that aid agencies are scrambling to address. For the first time since anyone can remember, there is a very real possibility of four famines in Somalia, South Sudan, Nigeria, and Yemen breaking out at once, endangering more than 20 million lives. International aid officials say they're facing one of the biggest humanitarian disasters since World War II, and they are determined not to repeat the mistakes of the past. End quote. Scott Paul, tell us, what were the mistakes of the past? It's difficult to follow Jeffrey Gettleman's prose, I'll tell you that. The mistakes of the past we're talking about For one thing, the fact that we're in this situation, Ralph, where the world is facing this uh, food crisis of this scale, I think reflects already a series of mistakes the international community has made, not to mention local actors. When you have 20 million people, as we do, that are on the verge of famine, you've already lost because there's already people dying, children dying at an unacceptable rate. There's people who will not be able to prevent 
health and nutrition scenarios that will be permanently damaging for them and their families. So I think first it's important to take stock of the recent mistakes that people have made to get us here. I think what Jeffrey Gettleman was probably referring to was in 2011, when the last famine was declared in Somalia, there was really significant advanced warning that this was going to happen. The rains failed again and again, and international donors didn't really do what they needed to do to make funding available and to remove the barriers to get humanitarian aid to the people who needed it most. And then what you saw in July of that year, famine was declared in some regions, and all of a sudden everybody scrambled and said, okay, let's make sure this money is there and let's make sure we remove the obstacles. So now we're in a similar situation. We've had the warnings, and now we're really at the tipping point in a lot of these crises. In South Sudan, people in parts of the country are already living in famine conditions. People in parts of Nigeria are already living in famine-like conditions, and Somalia and Yemen have huge populations that are on the brink of that kind of extensive mortality. So there is still a window to contain the damage and prevent it from getting worse, but we've already made a, a series of really unforgivable mistakes. Tell us what they are. One, two, three. One, two, three. Well, for one thing, if we were really serious about forestalling some of these outcomes, we would have mobilized this funding more quickly. There's now a conversation taking place in Congress about getting a billion dollars of extra money available to inject into these four crises. That money could have been made available a year ago. And rather than put it into the big appeals, what we should have been doing is trying to find ways to get it to the front lines, to agencies that are implementing on the ground. In some cases, those agencies are, are organizations like Oxfam. But in a lot of cases, it's actually Somali, Yemeni organizations, South Sudanese organizations that have been working in communities for decades and are really best placed to understand what the needs are. The second mistake I think we need to not make over again, and this is over a longer period of time, is we need to understand and appreciate and react to the reality of climate change. A lot of the situations we're confronting, particularly in the Horn of Africa, have to do with successive and severe droughts of a scale that a generation ago we couldn't have imagined. And we have to make sure that it doesn't get worse from here on out. And lastly, I'll just say, in a lot of these crises, the primary issues are food and water, but those are being made worse by the fact that people are unsafe and armed groups and foreign militaries fighting wars, sometimes with the support and aid from the United States, are endangering people even more and in certain cases making it difficult for them to access food and making it difficult for them to keep their families safe. So those, I'd, I'd say, there's no simple one, two, three, but I'd say that's a start. Well, you know, I've asked just ordinary people over the years about how to prevent famine, and they can't understand because there's plenty of food around in the world for that purpose, and water can be transported or purified. And, and they ask the question, how can modern technology, airplanes, helicopters, whatever, on the ground, how can they actually deliver the aid to the families, mothers and fathers who need it, getting by the wars, getting by the profiteers who try to grab it ahead of time and sell it on the black market? What are the ideal ways to get in, assuming there is money, which we'll get back to, how, how small amount of money it is compared to what is spent on foolish things in this world? <laughs> Couldn't have said it better. And, and to start where you started, it's heartbreaking that famine takes place anymore in a world of plenty. I mean, we view that as an injustice on its face. That there's, there's just no way we should be accepting in a world where there's such great wealth that some people don't have enough food to live. At a more granular level, you know, part of the problem here is that the scale of these crises is so massive that, you know, we are using helicopters in parts of Nigeria to get food in. And we are, you know, using innovative technology to make sure that we can get to people in South Sudan. But the scale of these crises is so huge that humanitarian aid can only do so much. And we can use the best technology we have available to make sure we can access people. But as long as the parties to the conflicts that we're working in want to keep us out, and more importantly, as long as markets become less functional and food becomes more and more expensive for people, it's really only, there's only so much we're going to be able to do. In Nigeria and Yemen in particular, I mean, these are massive food crises. 
that the private sector should be able to solve. But unfortunately, the parties to the conflicts there are making it more difficult for the markets to work. And it's increasing prices and making it more difficult for people to earn money. And so anytime there's a, a fundamental dynamic where food prices are skyrocketing and people are either too unsafe or working in too dysfunctional an economy to be able to earn any money, you know, aid agencies will try to fill the gap, but there's always going to be that additional crisis. But what about this idea of delivery? This always intrigued me. I mean, we have drones that go anywhere in the world. There are displaced camps, refugee camps, that are packed with thousands of people. Let's envision something, Scott Paul. Let's envision the following. Exactly what kind of food could be dropped from the air? I know there are sacks of grain, but that takes preparation, and there may be fights over the grain on the ground. What about small amounts of food in small parcels that can be delivered and handed out. And before you answer that question, just tell me, how many calories really are needed to keep someone alive? I don't mean on the brink of death, but someone alive and functioning, including how much water. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty here. Yeah. Let's start with the, the airdrops, <laughs> and let's start with what could be dropped. As you know, there's a lot of nutrition that can be packed in a tiny little package for each individual person. Right. I think you outlined really the, the issues with airdrops. You know, we'll do it as a last resort, but the problem with airdrops is as soon as food drops down, when there are armed groups in the area, they're going to look to profit off of those airdrops. And so we're less, I mean, we, we have no interest in seeing armed groups get rich off of food profiteering. We want to make sure that it's the pregnant and lactating mothers that are able to get food and it's the elderly that are able to get food and children. So again, we'll do it as a last resort, but it's not really, the issue unfortunately isn't a calorie count. I'll, I'll give you a great example of a place where there's a massive food crisis and technology unfortunately can't be the answer. So in Yemen, there's 17 million people that don't know where their next meal is coming from, with 7 million on the brink of famine. That's the biggest food crisis anywhere in the world. And the country relies on imports to meet 90% of its food needs. The main port that people use to import their food is about to be attacked by the Saudi-led coalition supported by the United States. And as soon as that attack commences, that port will be out of commission. Now, Oxfam is actually inside Yemen on both sides of the front line all over the country, and we're helping more than a million people get clean and safe water and get cash that they can use to buy food in the local markets. But there's just as soon as that port closes, there's no practical way to get the quantity of food that we're going to need into the markets to prevent the prices from skyrocketing and, and to prevent famine situations in certain parts of the country. So. At the end of the day, I mean, we, we can use, we do use technology as an important stopgap in some of these situations, but there's really no substitute for the political will we need to get the parties to allow aid to get to the most affected people. Well, then why would Yemen import 90% of its food? It's a fairly semi-tropical country. Fruits, vegetables can be grown. I've never heard of a country that size. It has about 27 million people, I understand, living there. And they can grow dates and figs, very high nutrition foods. What got them to import, and it's not recent, 90% of their food and yeah. be so reliant? Yeah, and that's before the crisis. It has a lot to do with the control of the local economy. So part of it is not all of the land is arable. There's a lot of inarable land in Yemen. But in the parts where farming is possible, a lot of the land is taken up producing cash crops, mostly khat, which is a mild narcotic that's used throughout the region and, and, and throughout Somalia. You know, and it's, is, is it great for local people? Absolutely not. But for the wealthy people who control a lot of the farmland, that's going to be the crops that they're going to want to grow, not staple foods. So that it's, it's very difficult for them to sort of turn on a dime and start producing staple foods for local markets. Now, especially markets and farmland, as well as other factories and sources of production, have actually come under attack by the parties to the conflict. So that adds an, an additional dimension, making it more difficult and reducing some of the incentives around creating local production. But, you know, like you said, it's, it's a geographically small country with a large population, and they've had... You know, for years and years and years, this dependency on imports for survival.
What is the United Nations doing through UNICEF and other food aid agencies? And give us an idea how much money is needed here to just get through the first stage of the crisis in the next year. The UN is the indispensable humanitarian actor. There are lots of problems with humanitarian delivery. I think humanitarian reform has been a constant process since humanitarian response became something that people did as a career. But the reality is if we didn't have the UN, we'd have to reinvent it. And they play a coordinating role to make sure that we don't duplicate our efforts and to make sure that we identify the people who need help most. And they also play a frontline role. They're operational and an organization like UNICEF carries out the kind of assistance without which many, many, many children would die. And you opened the program talking about the Trump administration's budget cutting support to these UN agencies. That will absolutely devastate people in these countries. Now you also asked how much is this gonna cost? In the first stage, I'd say between now and July, what's needed is $4.4 billion for South Sudan, Nigeria, Somalia, and Yemen, basically just to contain the damage that's already emerged. Like I said, there's there's a proposal to make about $1 billion available in U.S. funding, which would be a generous contribution for the U.S. in terms of humanitarian response. I'm sure many of your listeners know this, but the context for all of this conversation is that all funding for international, non-military international affairs programming in the U.S., that's diplomacy, cultural exchanges, climate change, development, humanitarian work, all of that amounts to less than a penny out of every dollar in the federal budget. So in terms of the cost to the taxpayer, this is a really, really small amount that's needed to save lives. Well, the situation is even worse. Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, who is a lawyer, said a few days ago that if the United Nations doesn't rescind its resolution condemning Israeli colonies in the Palestinian West Bank, that the U.S. should cut off all aid to the United Nations without even thinking, the so-called lawyer, without even thinking of the deaths that would ensue in these countries you've talked about, Yemen, Somalia, Nigeria, and other areas. What do you think we should do as citizens dealing with Congress on this? Because that seems to be the initial root of the appropriations dilemma. Congress needs to hear from their constituents, from Americans, that the direction signaled by the Trump administration budget and the direction that we would take if we cut off funding to the United Nations is not in our interests and is completely incompatible with our values. The theme that we've heard out of the administration so far is America first. To my mind, that creates all sorts of false choices. It makes you decide, are you human first or are you an American? You know, do you believe in international security or do you believe in national security? Should money be going to help people here or over there? And, and the reality is, for 70 years at a minimum, people in both parties have recognized, at least in theory, if not in practice, that shared prosperity and shared security benefit us here in the United States and are consistent with the values we want to express. So these kinds of moves by Senator Graham and this America First rhetoric on the part of the administration, it's, it's taking us in the, in the wrong direction. Congress needs to hear it because Senator Graham, in addition to having authored that bill, is also the senior Republican responsible for spending money on all non-military foreign affairs. And he's actually, despite the message that his bill has sent, he's been a champion of funding international affairs programs, including the United Nations, at pretty high levels for a long time. But So he needs to hear from people, and other, other members of Congress need to hear from people, that the direction that these signals would take us in is the wrong one. Now, Scott, Paul, let's say somebody comes to you and says, okay, Mr. Paul, here's $20,000. I want you to perform in front of the White House a demonstration that would get mass media because of its focus its challenge, its poignancy, and its rhetoric, good rhetoric. How would you put a demonstration in front of the White House to confront the Trumpsters and get media Ralph, over yeah. it? Ralph, that is a great question. I, I have an answer for you. I would find people in South Sudan, Nigeria, Somalia, and Yemen who are defending human rights and who 
have witnessed for themselves the generosity that they've seen in their communities. I'd fly them to the United States. I'd make a big stink about the importance of being able to get them visas in the first place, because, as you know, people in Somalia and Yemen are designated by the executive orders, if they're ever enforced, to not ever receive visas. And I would take them to the front of the White House and I would offer them a stipend to themselves, either use a role play scenario or somehow tell their stories to demonstrate how much goodwill there is in these communities and how much will there is to survive. Because I think the more Americans hear about food crises around the world, about conflicts around the world, there's, at least in some quarters, there's a crisis fatigue. And I think with that crisis fatigue, people get the impression that people who are stuck in crises are either all aligned with militias or armed groups that are seeking to do harm to other people or, you know, supporting political agendas that sort of feed into this narrative of a zero-sum game. The reality that we see is that in South Sudan, people are boiling lily bulbs for sustenance to make soup. And when they do it, they're sharing what they have with their neighbors. You know, people in Somalia, when they emigrate, they're sending a lot of their income back home to help people survive. And people who are getting those remittances are spreading out their money across communities. We're seeing the same kinds of generosity in communities in Nigeria and in Yemen. What I'd like to do with that money is really counter the narrative and show how committed to each other people are in these areas. Well, do you think there are people who are so upset about this? They may be working in a religious charity that some of them would go to the White House and basically announce that they're fasting indefinitely the way political prisoners have done in the U.S., Ireland, and elsewhere. Would that be a dramatic way to wake up the media and wake up the Congress day after day? Yeah, I think so. I think we have to probably talk through how to figure out when it would end because uh, ultimately it's not a a financial contribution that's going to end this crisis by itself. We've actually started to have some of those conversations with religious communities. There's a strong outpouring of support for people who are living in these emergencies and a sense of solidarity. And people have asked, you know, should we be fasting? Should we be going to Congress? Should we be, what can we be doing to help? I think fasting would be one really powerful way to do it. Maybe in front of the Congress as well. Are there going to be congressional hearings on this again to highlight it and tell us what needs to be done there? There have been congressional hearings already so far. There was a hearing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee last week, one on Yemen specifically a few weeks ago, one on Somalia a week and a half ago. The interest is now there. I find it incredibly depressing that it's taken us to a point where 20 million people are at risk of famine, that Congress finally starts paying attention to the humanitarian dimension of these crises. Who are the champions? In the old days, Senator Ted Kennedy, Senator William Fulbright would be really out front on international aid to crises overseas, including famine. Tell us who are the champions in the House and Senate. Sure. On the Senate side, Senator Chris Murphy has taken a really, really strong voice. Senator Patrick Leahy has always been a strong voice on these issues. On the Republican side, I mentioned Senator Graham has has spoken out on the budget, but I'd add also Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Todd Young, who have in the past sort of expressed interest in humanitarian issues are really starting to find their voice and and be more forceful. On the House side, Congressman Jim McGovern has been a longstanding voice around issues relating to hunger. Congressman Keith Ellison, Congresswoman Karen Bass. On the Republican side, uh, I'd, I'd add also Barbara Lee from California. And on the Republican side, we're really seeing Congressman Rooney from Florida step forward as a voice within his caucus. So let's let's make sure to thank these folks for stepping forward, and particularly in an environment where everything that they're getting from the White House is America first. We're not sending money over there. We don't care. We're really taking on this fight. And also, listeners, if uh, since these are members of, of the Senate and House that Scott Paul just mentioned are already convinced of the urgency. What you need to do with them is, when they come back home, is to raise the level of urgency, as well as have them redouble their efforts and collaborate with each other and multiply their energies. What are the global Christian and Muslim charities doing here, both global Muslim and Christian charities? They've been very active. Charities like Catholic Relief Services and World Vision, Islamic Relief, 
you know, they're all on the front lines together with us. And there's an incredible amount of solidarity and an agreement on humanitarian principles within the community. The way we do our work together is hand in glove. We all want to collaborate. And I think those of us who are motivated from a faith perspective and those of us who are not motivated by a faith perspective, but a general humanitarian concern, we take the same approach to these issues. All right, that's the Christian side. What about the Muslim side? There are giant Islamic foundations by very wealthy Muslims that have been set up in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf states. Saudi Arabia has a very serious responsibility for the famine in Yemen. They're, as you say, about to bomb the port that brings in most of the food, but they have bombed again and again civilian areas with loss of life and devastated public facilities. What's being done there? Some of these foundations are five, ten, fifteen billion dollar assets. Well, I mentioned, you know, there there are global independent charities like Islamic Relief and United Muslim Relief that are are with us on the front lines. See things very much the same way we do. We collaborate with them very closely. But you're absolutely right. There are a number of Gulf donors who have the foundations associated with them that have expressed some interest in humanitarian response, but haven't really come into the tent. Some of them support ad hoc projects here and there. Some of them make major donations. Some of them are still waiting for a way in. One example that I'd point to, for example, is is Turkey in Somalia. Over the past five or six years, Turkey has invested a great deal in Somalia. What we've tried to do with Turkey and other actors like Turkey that want to be more involved in response to these emergencies is we've tried to sort of work together to come to agreement around a set of humanitarian principles. You know, it's we spend a lot of energy and a lot of time studying the situation, making sure we do no harm, making sure we target people who are most vulnerable, mothers, female head of households, the elderly, young children. And so it's important for some of these donors and organizations that are looking to find their voice on humanitarian issues to learn from our successes and our failures as they embark on their own journeys there. In a few minutes, we have Les Scott Paul of Oxfam. The problem of the military conflicts needs to be highlighted. I mean, there are militias, there are wars, there are countries bombing, there are civil wars. This is an enormous cause in addition to the drought of these famines. And Donald Trump wants to add 54 billion more dollars to our already bloated military budget. None of it, as far as we know, is going to go to peacekeeping forces of the UN. None of it is going to go to negotiating an end to these conflicts, that is waging peace instead of waging war. And a lot of it is going to go to armed countries like Saudi Arabia and others who are using these weapons in unbridled manner to devastate civilian areas. So what is Oxfam, or what are you proposing in that area? Well, Ralph, there's two issues you just brought up, and they're both really important. The first is the budget. Adding $52 billion to the defense budget and slashing slashing development, slashing diplomacy, I mean, it basically guarantees that if you encounter an American in this world, you're that much more likely to do it at the end of a gun barrel. And that doesn't really help anybody. It doesn't express our values. And you know, as, as Secretary Mattis said as recently as a year ago, if we don't fully fund the State Department, and I'd add if we don't fully fund USAID and the United Nations, he's going to have to buy more bullets. And I don't think that's a principled strategy or a successful strategy. The other issue you raise is the issue of arms sales and security cooperation. You know, it's amazing to me as I talk with people in the government how unstrategic people are with respect to the sale of arms and defense cooperation and training. You know, it's the 21st century and people in government still view arms sales as as a party favor. It's something we give to our allies to make them like us and to make them more dependent on our defense equipment. Meanwhile, those same arms sales are fueling, literally, some of these conflicts and then signaling diplomatically that the U.S. is behind some of these conflicts. You know, when I was in Yemen last year, the most common question I received was, why is your country bombing us? You know, they're not interested in the details of who's flying the planes. They're interested in who's supplying the political will and the the diplomatic cover for these wars to continue. And in Yemen, and that's certainly true, I'd say in, in Nigeria and South Sudan, there's a lot more we could do 
to make sure that the, the militaries that we're close with and the governments that we work with are more accountable to civilians and more respectful to the law of armed conflict. Well, before we close, why don't you tell our listeners how they can contact you and Oxfam and what they can contribute if they wish to in terms of funds for relief. Please visit www.oxfamamerica.org. You'll find there an opportunity to contribute to our response. We're responding in all four countries that are facing famine, helping people get life-saving food, clean water, and sanitation. You can also find ways to take action there to make sure that your member of Congress is listening to your voice and making sure that we collectively, as a country and the U.S. government, does its part to respond to these crises. So please visit www.oxfamamerica.org. Well, famines should never occur in, in the world of plenty. Poor distribution of food and water, poor rescue operations, too many obstacles to the rescue operation that are preventable. This is a scar on the conscience of the world. You look at the pictures of these little children with uh, bony hands and fingers, swollen bellies. We should all be collectively ashamed of ourselves and no more than members of Congress and the White House who are misspending our tax dollars in the tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars every year for corporate welfare, bailouts, handouts, giveaways, immense waste and corruption in the military budget, and a total lack of humane imagination in terms of turning our country into a humanitarian superpower. Just before we close, Scott Paul, what other countries that are much smaller than the U.S. who are doing a better job of helping deal with these four country famines? I would say most large European countries, as well as the smaller Scandinavian countries, are all doing their part. You know, and as far as humanitarian funding has been concerned, we've done our part as well. The risk is that, number one, we stop doing our part and we stop, uh, as the biggest economy, setting the pace for everyone else. And, and of course, the other risk is that we let our narrow parochial political and military aims overwhelm our humanitarian impulses. Like you said, if we express our values and we're able to show and demonstrate some empathy with children struggling to survive, I think our policies in a lot of these regions would look very different. You hear a lot about Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway, really performing far better than countries around the world. Just before we close, what is China and Japan? What are China and Japan doing here? You don't hear much about their humanitarian efforts. Are there any in these four countries? Japan does contribute to humanitarian appeals at a significant clip, but China not so much. <laughs> China's investing very heavily in Africa for economic gain and presence, but not in humanitarian forms. Why do no. you think that's the case? I don't think that we collectively as an international community or uh, the Chinese public have figured out how to demonstrate to the Chinese government the importance of making these contributions, but we're going to keep trying. Well, in closing, we need someone like Dick Gregory to start a fast in front of the White House. He's done it in the past, and others could do it now, just to dramatize this terrible, terrible tragedy that's unfolding in these countries and bids to spread to other countries as well in the African and West Asia region. Thank you very much, Scott Paul of Oxfam. This obviously is a subject that needs continual attention on radio and TV. Thank you very much, Scott, and, and thank you for your good work and the good work of Oxfam, an international charity of impressive reputation. Thank you for using your program to shine a spotlight on these issues, Ralph. You're welcome. We've been speaking to Scott Paul, Oxfam America's senior humanitarian policy advisor. We will link to Oxfam and all the great work they do at RalphNaderRadioHour.com. Now let's take a short break and find out the latest outrage that is taking place in corporate America with the corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. Russell? From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your corporate crime reporter morning minute for Friday, April 7, 2017. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Wells Fargo will pay $110 million to settle a class action lawsuit alleging that the bank opened up to 2 million accounts for customers without getting their permission. It's the first private settlement that Wells has reached since the company paid $185 million to federal and California authorities late last year. Authorities said bank employees, driven by high-pressure sales tactics, opened the bank and credit card accounts without customer authorization. 
Wells also disclosed that a federal regulator had downgraded its rating under a law designed to help monitor and promote banking practices to low-income and minority communities. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency cited the sales practices as one reason for the downgrade. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. You know, it's hard to overstate the benefits that antibiotics have had on both the length and quality of life for millions of human beings. But just like most things in life, too much of a good thing can have unintended consequences. In fact, our next guest tells us that, quote, if we want antibiotics to work for future generations, we need to act fast to curb their overuse in animals. David? Emily L. Heil is an assistant professor of pharmacy practice and science at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy in Baltimore. She is coordinator of the anti microbial stewardship program at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Her op-ed in the Washington Post is entitled, How Maryland Can Combat the Spread of Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Emily Heil. Thanks so much for having me. Emily Heil, why don't we start with common experience of people. I haven't met anybody who doesn't know a friend, a relative, or a neighbor who has lost their lives due to a hospital infection. And hospital-induced infections have been estimated by the Centers for Disease Control to take 200 to 250 American lives a day. Now, not all of them are due to antibiotic resistance, which is the subject of our interview with you today. But why don't you give us an idea of the best estimate as to how many Americans die every year because they have taken antibiotics that don't work. They have eaten meat and poultry laced with antibiotics without knowing it. And that increases the resistance of these microbes who have an incredible talent for mutating and resisting one antibiotic drug after another. Give us an idea of this violent epidemic that has been going on for over 50 years and until recently very little done about it, including by the medical profession. So the best estimates I have come from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the CDC estimates that there's at least 2 million illnesses and 23,000 deaths every year that are attributed to infections caused by resistant bacterial organisms. So it's certainly a, a large and growing problem. Well, one of the problems, as you point out in your article, is that agribusiness has profited enormously over 50 years by convincing farmers and ranchers to pump antibiotics into the bodies of these animals, even if they're not sick. They put it in their feed as a preventive mechanism. Could you describe that process and how much of the antibiotics that are sold in this country are used on these domesticated animals? Absolutely. This practice actually dates back to around World War II when we were having a protein crisis. And so scientists were desperately trying to find ways to increase our animal production and grow animals that were larger to, to meet the needs of not only our soldiers, but also the folks back in the country. And sort of inadvertently through a series of kind of fun scientific discoveries, they were originally looking into using vitamin D for this purpose and sort of inadvertently found out that antibiotics in subtherapeutic doses actually led to animals that were larger in size than animals that did not receive antibiotics. So it just became sort of this standard practice where subtherapeutic doses of antibiotics were included in animal feed and the practice has just persisted since then. And you know, now we have we have better animal husbandry practices. We have other ways to avoid disease in our population and promote animal growth without using these antibiotics, but the practice still persists. And it's been cited that up to eighty percent of antibiotics by volume that we use in this country are actually not used in humans at all, but they're used in the animal sector. And so that's a huge concern because we can do a lot on the human end, but without action on the animal end as well, we're not going to really be able to slow the antibiotic resistance crisis with that level of volume being used in agriculture. And there are farmers, you know, who, who get it now that overuse of antibiotics is costing them money. It reduces the natural immunity of the animals, causes more illness. The antibiotics are expensive. And, of course, they're not doing their customers any service by this indirect transfer of antibiotic residues into the bodies of human beings who eat 
beef, pork, chicken, lamb, etc. There are some countercurrents in farmland, aren't there? Absolutely. I think in the grand scheme of things, we have a lot of people moving in support of removing antibiotics from routine use in agriculture. And a lot of this has really been due to consumer pressure, which is wonderful. We've had some major restaurant groups that have come forward and said that they're only going to use meat that was sourced and raised without antibiotics, and then that helps to drive the market. And there's a lot of support from this within the agriculture community. There are new FDA regulations that went into effect January 1. That Why don't you describe but- them? Yeah, why don't you describe the new FDA regulations? Those both went into effect in early January 1. They are guidance measures, but there's been commitment, at least from all of the relative part, relevant parties, that they are going to participate in following these new guidances. But there's one called the Veterinary Feed Directive, and that really is going to increase veterinary oversight over antibiotic utilization for agriculture. It really pulls medically antibiotic import or medically important antibiotics from being available over the counter. And so they would need to have veterinary oversight so that you do have a vet that's making clinical judgments about an animal's health uh, before antibiotics are given to an animal. And the other one really removes labeling that says that you can use antibiotics for growth promotion. And so that would make it illegal then to utilize antibiotics for anything that's considered an off-label use. So both of those do have promise to help drastically decrease the volume that we're seeing used in this country. There are some loopholes, though. They're not going to prevent everything because they still don't remove labeling for disease prevention, which is a practice where you can still use antibiotics at subtherapeutic doses across your herd for disease prevention. So there's a couple of loopholes. States like California have passed legislation that closed those loopholes. And the other big issue with the FDA regulations is while they're a huge step in the right direction, there's not a lot of infrastructure in place to make sure that they actually work. So we're really missing key data on where and how antibiotics are being used in agriculture to understand how things are changing and if these regulations are going to make a big difference. You're pointing to a huge problem of enforcement and the FDA budget for enforcement is minuscule. They can't even inspect the drugs made in China which are exported to the U.S. Most people don't know that 80 percent of the ingredients in our medicines come from China and India and laboratories that aren't adequately inspected by FDA inspectors over there and 60 percent of the actual drugs that people use every day from their medicine cabinets are imported by drug companies in this country just to make more profit. They're already given tax credits for research. They're already given free research on clinically tested drugs for the National Institutes of Health. These drug companies are making massive profits and they're still jeopardizing the American people by outsourcing or shipping their production into these countries. And so let's talk about the role of the drug industry. They've been called the major drug pushers in our country. They want to sell more and more of these drugs and they push it on the the farmers and the ranchers and they push it on the doctors. I mean, uh, we have a culture where people go to the doctor and if the doctor doesn't prescribe any antibiotic for a cold or a flu, the patient gets upset and says, why aren't you giving me a pill? And of course, doctors have been culpable too because they're over prescribing antibiotics. They don't distinguish a cold that's viral based from a cold that's bacterial based. So do you want to give us your scan on this phenomena that I've just sketched out? <laughs> Sure. So I'll start with the industry one and then end with the uh, physician culture one because I think that's one of the more fascinating areas. But in terms of industry, there was a big exodus for a lot of the large pharma companies in antibiotic research and development a couple of years back because, frankly, antibiotics are very difficult to develop and they're not profitable drugs. And we really do need industry and partners in academia to prioritize discovery and development of new antibiotic agents, particularly agents that have novel targets of action, which is something we really haven't seen in the market. Market in a couple of years. So luckily there has been some attempts to spur this development through legislation that makes it more desirable for the drug industry to get back into antibiotic research and development. The one that comes to mind most recently is called the GAIN Act and that was passed in 2011 and gives um, it extends market exclusivity for newly approved antibiotics and allows an FDA approval pathway that's got priority for drugs that target new bacteria or bacteria that are considered to be a big public health threat. 
And there's also some provisions in the new 21st Century Cures Bill that would establish a new FDA approval pathway for antibiotics. So there's some other legislation coming down the pike. Something known as the Ready Act was introduced actually just a week ago by Representatives Paulson and Thompson that would provide a tax cut for antibiotics that meet an unmet need. So I think there was a huge exodus from the space, and we definitely did not have the volume of companies involved in antibiotic research and development that we needed, which is a huge problem because we can't address this crisis without new antibiotics to help us cover resistant organisms. But it's nice to see that some legislation is being introduced that hopefully will help antibiotic research and development back into action. Well, before you go to the physicians, Emily, what about the argument that you just can't let Americans die because uh, the profit strategy uh, doesn't click for these big drug companies and that there are certain zones of urgency where the government should develop their own advanced antibiotic drugs. What do you think about that? I think it's, it's certainly an, an important point. There's a lot of great research going on in academia that's largely supported by the government as it relates to antibiotic research and development that we need funding to continue to support. Antibiotics are not going to be profitable necessarily because people don't take them for their whole life like they might take a blood pressure drug, for example. And if you have an antibiotic that targets a resistant organism, you know, luckily it's not going to be used in a huge population of people. We don't want antibiotics with that spectrum of coverage used broadly. So they're not necessarily going to be profitable, but they're very expensive to develop and study. So having funding from a different sector, perhaps a governmental sector to, to spur that development, I think would be hugely beneficial. You know, there's a precedent for that. The second leading cause of hospitalization in Vietnam for our soldiers was malaria. And the drug companies weren't interested in developing anti-malarial drugs because there wasn't much profit in it. So the government in Washington said, okay, we'll fund Walter Reed Hospital and Bethesda Naval Hospital, and we'll get the best researchers, PhDs, MDs, and we'll do it ourselves. And that for decades, they had a marvelous record. They developed three out of the four leading anti-malarial drugs over a period of years, and they did it on a fraction I mean, like less than 5% of what the drug companies claim they would have to spend to develop these new anti-malarial drugs. So there is a precedent. It hasn't gotten much publicity because when the government does the right thing, it doesn't get much publicity. But there is a very powerful precedent there in those two research hospitals. Why don't you tell us about the physicians and how they often say the patient demanded an antibiotic prescription? I really think that this is one of the most challenging and fascinating parts of the whole antibiotic crisis. There's a huge behavioral and psychological element to antibiotic prescribing. There's actually studies that show that doctors are more likely to prescribe antibiotics when they believe their patients expect them, even if they know that the probability of that patient having a bacterial infection is low. I think the best way to think about these types of situations are those urgent care clinics or quick clinics located in a drugstore. Patients go because maybe they have a cold, maybe they have the flu, but they feel cruddy enough that they want to seek care. And the way we treat most viruses that cause up respiratory tract infections is that we don't treat them, actually. They have to run their course. Patients just get supportive care like acetaminophen for a fever, extra hydration, but you certainly don't need antibiotics. But in the, most of those situations, then, the patient's leaving the clinic empty-handed, and sometimes that makes patients feel very unsatisfied. They have this expectation that if they seek care, they should leave with something tangible, and then maybe they'll hop on to Yelp and give that clinic a bad review and and go down the street to another clinic. You can also see a lot of great examples of this where parents provide a lot of pressure on pediatricians to prescribe antibiotics to their children or children of elderly patients put pressure on their physicians to prescribe antibiotics to their parents who are in a nursing home. You can also see interesting trends in antibiotic prescription even based on the time of day. So there's been data that the odds of prescribing antibiotics at the end of the day are much higher than earlier in the day. So as the fatigue catches up and maybe you've already denied five patients antibiotics earlier that day, do you just give in? I think that it's not just a, a physician issue, it's a patient issue as well, that we need to work together on both sides. Patients need to have yes. more awareness and more realistic expectations, but physicians also need to learn how to manage these patient expectations as well. And not only that, it is obviously a patient education priority because when they really need antibiotics, they may not work for them and they may die or get sicker as a result. David and Steve, do you have any questions of Emily Heil? Uh, 
Yeah, it's interesting as you're talking about that, because I'm just thinking back to my own life and seeing a doctor and I had a scrape on my knee just from playing softball that I had a scab on it and she prescribed an antibiotic. And, you know, I took the first pill just out of, you know, because the doctor told me to do that. And I realized I, what does a scrape on my knee? I get these all the time. What am I doing this for? But the, the, of course, I had to take the whole course because if you don't, that's even worse, I guess. But yeah, I've, I've personally experienced this for a scrape on my knee. And it's definitely uh, important to have patient engagement in the conversation and patient engagement, not just in the I Googled that I think I have an infection and I demand you give me antibiotics, but also, you know, the patients and physicians should have a collaborative discussion about where antibiotics are and are not indicated and also talk about the potential harms of using them when they're not, because I think that's something that we are not doing as good of a job about educating the public on are the harms of taking antibiotics when they're not necessary. Could you speak more on the financial incentive of doctors to prescribe these antibiotics? I'm personally not really aware of any financial incentives for doctors to prescribe antibiotics. I think there's a couple of issues you know, related to patient satisfaction. Doctors are under a lot of pressure related to patient satisfaction scores to make sure that the patients leave clinics happy. And so if you have a patient that will not be happy if they don't leave with a prescription for amoxicillin, I could see that putting undue pressure on physicians. But luckily, I don't see a lot of pressure on physicians related to, you know, direct to physician marketing from the drug industry or, or anything like that as it relates to antimicrobial prescribing. Well, before we leave, we've been talking with Emily Heil, Assistant Professor of Pharmacy Practice and Science at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy in Baltimore, Maryland. How would a regular consumer who, who eats meat, how would they avoid the meat that has antibiotic residue? Is there any labeling or do they have to simply go to organically labeled meat to be sure? That is a great question, and that is something that can have such a huge role in this crisis is the power of consumerism. If people go out and make a point to purchase meat that was raised without antibiotics and support businesses that use meat that was raised without antibiotics, that's really going to help us drive the market in the right direction where we'll start to see more people move away from products that were raised with antibiotics. So there's a website called eatwellguide.org, and it provides information about restaurants and, and chains that utilize only meat that was raised without antibiotics. And you want to look for USDA-backed claims on the label of your meat. So you want to look for certified organic, raised without antibiotics, or no antibiotics administered. So those are the only three USDA-backed claims that you can assure yourself that meat was raised without antibiotics. So natural doesn't count. No antibiotic residues doesn't count. Those are not USDA-backed claims. So you're looking for certified organic, raised without antibiotics, or no antibiotics administered on your food labels. And give that website again slowly. www.eatwellguide.org. Thank you very much, Emily Heil. This is obviously a subject that is going to become more and more prominent as we hear news reports of people with bacteria infections and there are no antibiotics that work in the hospital where they are trying to recover. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate your time and attention to this important matter. You're very welcome. We've been speaking to Emily Ohio, coordinator of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at the University of Maryland Medical Center, whose op-ed is entitled, How Maryland Can Combat the Spread of Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria. We will link to that at ralphnaderradiohour.com. All right, we have some time for some listener questions. David, why don't you do the honors on the first one? This question comes from Emo Nick Ralph. He writes, could a person run as a progressive in their community promising to enforce corporate crime and realistically carry it out because the laws exist and the public knows they're breaking them. So I'm curious, what specifically stops or could enable actual enforcement on every level? Well, it would be very, very good for a candidate to emphasize getting tough on corporate crime. I mean, the polls show enormous support for cracking down on the Wall Street crooks, for example, and breaking up the big banks and going after insurance company shenanigans. So it is a popular issue. The reason why very few candidates do run on a corporate crime enforcement platform is they want to raise money from the commercial interests for their campaign. But I think it's a real vote getter. 
And not only that, but you as a listener, if you meet a candidate for local, state, or national office, just say, what's your position on corporate crime enforcement? Are you soft on corporate crime? Or are you going to protect us as consumers, workers, taxpayers, and our environment by supporting bigger enforcement budgets and more inspectors? The enforcement budgets of federal agencies on corporate crime are pathetic. It's, it's like having a 100 police people in New York City with a corporate crime wave and saying you've got adequate enforcement resources. So just ask the question. At whatever level the candidate is running, routinely, pretty soon the press will pick it up. Hey, the people are asking the question about politicians' position on corporate crime enforcement. Ralph, apropos of our discussion last week with George Lakoff, did he offer any insight about how to express the issue of corporate crime in a way that would be an effective framing. He didn't, Steve, because he really wasn't asked about it specifically. But Russell Mulkyber of the Corporate Crime Reporter, which listeners hear, the Corporate Crime Minute, has a whole vernacular on making it very, very impactful. Like he talks about politicians taking the federal cop off the corporate crime beat. You know, you use street crime language that people hear all the time. And you don't use phrases like white collar criminals. You use corporate crooks. And that is very important because that tells the politician that the language has, has descended from wonky land or abstract land into phrases that people understand. And I know you've used the expression crime in the sweets. Crime in the sweets and Russell Mulcahy has used the expression corporate crime and violence because what is environmental toxicity? It's a form of violence. What are dangerously produced pharmaceuticals that kill people? It's a form of violence. What is contamination in food that results in diarrhea or dysentery or death? It's a form of silent violence. And so it's very important to create that kind of language and apply it to the corporate crooks. Thank you for your questions. Keep them coming either on Ralph's Facebook page or on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website or on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour Facebook page. I want to thank our guests once again, Scott Paul from Oxfam America and Emily Ohio, who talked to us about superbugs. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap Up. Okay, podcast listeners, time for The Wrap Up. First up is me asking a personal question of Scott Paul from Oxfam. Scott, I have actually a question if you got to have another minute. Yeah, sure. It's We seem to have covered the issues here. This is a more personal question that I, I think our listeners would be interested in. And it's that the, the, uh, the idea of famine and world hunger seems so large and intractable. My question to you is, on a personal level, what sustains you? What gives you hope? What keeps you going on all of this in the, in the face of that? It's an interesting question. What keeps me going, I think, is it's two things. One, on a very direct emotional level, I see the incredible generosity of people who are struggling to survive themselves. And when they get a little bit of food or when they get a little bit of money from someone outside the country, the instinct is almost never, how can I spend this on myself? How can I improve my position? How can I invest? You know, you see people immediately look around and say, whose life in my community can I save? How far can I make this money go in my extended family? So I am always buoyed by just the incredible imbalance of, you know, there's a, so much more compassion and will to survive together that I encounter on a daily basis than indifference, apathy, and selfishness. So that's one part of this. I think the other part is, you know, for the past 20, 25 years, on a policy level, even though it's very contended, and even though the Trump administration represents a lot of backsliding on this, you know, I see deeper forms of cooperation at the international level. I see uh, international legal norms becoming more more evolved. I see the opportunity for the United States to participate in an international community that's more humane and that identifies more with shared power than might makes right. 
Can I so, ask you a um, question about that? Uh, this is yeah. David Feldman. The, the Gates Foundation, are they exacerbating the situation? Or? How so? Well, some people say that the Bill Gates Foundation is making deals with tyrants and that fascism and military dictators create the climate for famine. And then his deals with Monsanto and genetically modified crops and fertilizers. He's the biggest buyer of fertilizers and genetically modified crops in Africa. He's come under a lot of criticism in Africa. And many people think that the Gates Foundation exacerbates famine. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. Ralph, have you heard that? Yeah, I, 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 there is considerable resistance to GMO crops in Africa and what they bring, which is consolidation of small farms into big plantations and stripping African farmers of control over their own seeds, that using a Monsanto GMO seeds that they have to pay uh, every year to buy instead of share among one another as they have for centuries of the agrarian other, tradition. Right, but the criticism of Gates is that because he's the biggest buyer in Africa and supplier, that he's maintaining the status quo by dealing with these dictators. And without freedom and democracy, these conditions for famine will continue. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm familiar with the criticism of Monsanto. And, you know, we've had a multi-year campaign focused on food production and targeting uh, major food and beverage companies in their supply chain. So that's one we're very involved in. But you know, the areas that are experiencing famine, you know, northeast Nigeria is Nigeria's least developed region. South Sudan is not a major source of big agribusiness. Same with Somalia and Yemen. So I, I could see what you're getting at with respect to general food security in Africa and, and the role of, of some of these large multinationals. But in, in the countries that are specifically at risk of famine, we're talking about an utter failure of governance that I think... Yeah. You know, has other, other drivers that are probably more prominent. Now, David asked two questions, one about readable Supreme Court decisions and whether Ralph thinks Trump could ever be a successful president. Ralph, okay. what, what do you consider the best written Supreme Court decision, like the most readable? If I wanted to read a Supreme Court decision and enjoy it, not the ending, but just in terms of how it's penned. I think the, the one we won on legislative veto, I can't remember the name of the plaintiff, but it, it eliminated more legislative vetoes than all other Supreme Court decisions up to date from day one. And it's readable? Yeah, it's very readable. And the other one is the airbag decision, the 9-0 affirmation telling the Department of Transportation that they have been waging regulatory war against the airbag and they better start issuing the standard to protect people. Okay. And the other one is the one we won on Allegheny Airlines, which allowed people who were bumped with confirmed tickets to be put on another flight and paid three, four hundred dollars in cash. Those are really readable. Okay. Well, I know what you're, you're going to be doing late at night, David. <laughs> I had one final question. This is like a, I was reading about, I'm not being funny here, but I, I was reading about the, the gas attacks in Syria and how Trump is hands off. And I thought yeah. that, you know, it's horrible what happened, but he's not going to invade or do anything. And I thought, yeah. could he unwittingly become a successful president? For example, if the Democrats take over Congress, would the joke on all of us be that four years from now, somehow he becomes a successful president? Did you ever think that way or is it just an impossibility? He's going to have to change his persona and his temperament and his triviality. He, that may, if the Democrats take over and he knows that he's done, you know, he can't get anything done. He's not likely to get reelected. He may become pragmatic. We're always waiting for the pragmatic Trump, but we haven't seen anything yet. The most recent waiting is whether he's going to suddenly flip over into single payer. There's a quote. Uh, that Farid Zakaria, the columnist, took out of his book, The America We Deserve. It's, it's an endorsement of single payer in the Canadian system, his own book. So we will well, see. That's the first test. There was a New York Post 
article by a guy named Buckley, F.H. Buckley or something, who was one of Trump's speechwriters that mm. was pro telling him, go single payer. This is in the New York Post recently? New York Post recently, yes. I when guess. Ryan's care fell. Yeah, that's guy. I have to get that. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Gingrich. Maybe we should have him on the show. Yeah. If you look at what Gingrich did in 94, two years into Clinton, it forced Clinton to triangulate and become like, I consider, you know, he was a horrible, I think, you know, obviously Clinton was terrible, but I'm just talking about historians like Michael Beschloss, those guys. Yeah, well, Clinton became like Gingrich. He he passed terrible bills in in telecommunication, agribusiness, corporate uh, wealth, so-called welfare reform. Uh, Yeah, he, he became more like Gingrich. So it is conceivable that Trump could triangulate after the midterms. Well, and, with the caveats that I just know. Yeah. And go down in history yeah. as a great president. Otherwise, if he can survive impeachment in the interim with yeah. the Russian connection. And then we presented Ralph with some listener questions. This question comes from Ann George. And she asks, what can we realistically expect for the 2018 election regarding breaking the stranglehold of the GOP? Well, it could be a landslide against the Republicans. Compliments of Donald J. Trump. He is already worrying the Republicans are going back home to these town meetings and there are no more empty seats. Instead of a, an echo in the auditorium with the staff outnumbering the attendees, the seats are filled with conservative and liberal people outraged at what's being taken away from them by the Republican-dominated Congress and the White House, like health care, like protection for their food and water, like cleaner air being dirtied by weakening air pollution regulations. So there is a possibility if the National Democratic Party stops being totally indentured by massive dialing for corporate dollars and pay attention to really how to win elections, which is through votes, First, not dollars. Dollars are inhibiting the Democrats from being stand-up politicians for the people and being on the people's side. But if they wake up, the time is ripe for an extraordinary landslide taking away the Congress from the Republican Party grip, even given the gerrymandered so-called safe districts. Ralph, did we see this kind of civic engagement in the 60s? Whenever I think of the 60s, I think of... The street protests and the smoke and and the Molotov cocktails. But was there this kind of civic engagement where people were showing up at town hall meetings? Yes, they showed up everywhere. In fact, Nixon was so fearful of the rumble from the people that even after the activity started declining in, in the early 70s, he would sign one consumer environmental bill after another that he abhorred. But he was fearful of the rumble from the people. You have said, Ralph, that the Vietnam War protests, the people in the streets, made what you did with the Nader's Raiders, the graduate students who were in suits, actually going to Congress and challenging federal agencies. You said that made that much that much easier for you. Absolutely. When the atmosphere of civic engagement and activity and arousal and anger is created, a lot of other groups who don't have The luxury of having people who protest and be part of giant marches, it benefits their issues as well. And in our case, it benefited the consumer issue of auto safety and food safety and drinking water safety. The civic action tends to be a seamless web when it has stamina, persistence, facts on their side, and represents public opinion. When it reaches that level, it's a left-right support, which is unstoppable. As I pointed out in my book, Unstoppable, the emerging left-right alliance to dismantle the corporate state. That's what's filling these town meetings, Steve. It's not just liberals. The Republicans are saying, oh, these are just the losers in last November's election protesting. Oh, no. You're seeing conservatives also outraged because, you know, they bleed, too. They get ripped off, too. They want their children to breathe clean air and, and drink safe water. and They, they want to have health care in return for the premiums they're paying or the dollars they're paying the doctors and hospitals. So I think that's the encouraging aspect of this rumble from the people since January 21st when the Women's March all over the country and in Washington really shook up the Washington establishment a day after the inauguration of Donald J. Trump. 
David, take the last question from Adrian V. Adrian V. Ralph writes, what would you advise Trump when it comes to renegotiating NAFTA? First, not to betray the workers that he promised to negotiate a NAFTA, which he called one of the worst deals ever signed on by the United States in one television interview and one campaign stop after another. And it looks like he's backing down. In fact, he's got people in the White House now from Goldman Sachs and elsewhere who are basically saying, we'll just tweak NAFTA just to give the impression that he's fulfilling his campaign promises. Now, if he did fulfill his campaign promises, he would give Mexico notice of withdrawing from NAFTA, which is in the fine print, in six months unless a proper renegotiation can occur. And Public Citizen, in its January-February newspaper, Public Citizen News, describes this situation with NAFTA and Trump and basically has a very concise list of reforms. It must eliminate the power of corporations to challenge governments if the governments have regulations and they can say, oh, it's costing us money, you've got to repeal the regulation. That's a terrible part of Chapter 11 in the NAFTA Treaty. It would get rid of the ban on buying local to support local economies. It would get rid of the monopoly protections for price-gouging pharmaceutical companies. And it would have strong and binding and enforceable labor, environmental, and consumer standards. It would have rules requiring, for example, that imported food into this country and other products would have to meet U.S. safety standards. And it would have a broad safeguard for public interest uh, policies in other areas. If people want more, they can go to globaltradewatch.org. Ralph, most people I talk to about this kind of thing think it is an issue between globalism versus protectionism. Either we're going to admit that we are in a global world or the people who are against this are want to go back to 19th century economic view. But it's not that way, right? Of course, that's too abstract a rebuttal. We're talking about honest trade. We're talking about fair trade. We're talking about getting rid of the commercial crimes, deceptions, negligence in the way drugs are manufactured, say, in China and India, as I mentioned, that are exported to the U.S. without a label, I might add. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about not letting our safety standards, which are not as strong as they should be, drag down to weaker safety standards in other countries. And we're talking about favoring local economies. I mean, if you're going to favor anything, you don't favor globalism first. You don't favor corporate globalism first. You favor self-reliant local economies the way Yes Magazine, a great magazine, by the way, that chronicles the tens of billions of dollars of growth in local economies, local energy, local community health clinics, local credit unions and community banks, for example, local transportation systems, all kinds of things are bubbling up, consumer cooperatives, because they know it's better. They know who the sellers are. They can eyeball them. There's not some absentee, anonymous mega corporation in New York, London, Tokyo, Shanghai pulling the strings. And I might say local farmer to consumer markets, which now number 8,000 in the USA. So we all know that NAFTA, TPP, they were all corporate managed agreements with very little, if no public interest groups, consumer groups, labor groups, environmental groups involved in the negotiation. I don't see Donald Trump inviting those groups in to renegotiate NAFTA. Do you? No, it's part of his betrayal. I mean, he's nothing but a Wall Street Goliath, a failed gambling czar who had four corporate bankruptcies, jumped ship with wealth, and shafted his shareholders, creditors, workers, you know, like the Atlantic City gambling casinos. So I think Trump's going to have a hard time camouflaging what he really is and what he's up to and all the big business appointments for his cabinet and his White House with a few tweets. That's not going to work anymore. A transcript of this episode will be posted on ralphnaderradiohour.com. For Ralph's weekly blog, go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. We'll talk to you then, Ralph. Thank you. And listeners, if you like what you hear on these programs, I'd appreciate if you'd read my two recent books. One, 
breaking through power, it's easier than we think. It's a short paperback. And the other is a fable that I've written called Animal Envy to get across the interrelatedness between human beings, natural habitats, and the animal world.